When a disciple followed a rabbi, he, he followed his teaching, he followed his way, he followed his conduct. Uh, a, a, a disciple wanted to know more. He didn't want to just know what the rabbi knew. He, he wanted to become like his rabbi. Now, all these different rabbis had different ways that they viewed the things of God. They, one rabbi might, might put an emphasis on this commandment, and everything he taught kind of flowed from that commandment. Another rabbi would see something different, and so when he taught and when he shared with his disciples, it kind of flowed from the vein that he thought was the most important. And there were many different veins. Now, all the stuff they were sharing was probably true, but they all had a different viewpoint. They all had a different place that they were coming from. Now, when these lawyers got to Jesus, they said, well, Jesus, what do you say? What is your point of view? What is the point of emphasis that you have? What are your disciples like? What are your disciples going to be taught? What are we going to see as a characteristic in your disciples' life as you're training them? And that's when he said, here it is. Here's what my point of emphasis is. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is, is God and the Lord and Lord alone, and you shall love God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. He doesn't say it like that in the recording of Matthew, but he does it in, in, in Mark and in Luke as well. He uses all of those. He says, you shall love God with all your heart. And we looked at that last week. And uh, that's, that's something that every person that wants to walk with God has to have a firm understanding of. That that's what it's all about. You love God with every fiber of your being. If you do that, I guarantee you, God's going to work it out. He's going to be able to work with you. He's going to be able to take you. Where, when you're wrong, he's going to be able to make you right. When, where you're right, he's going to make you righter. Where you're off, he's going to set you straight. You can count on him. He's trustworthy. He loves you that much. He loves me that much. That's why he saved us. That's why he redeemed us, because of his love. And we can trust him. As long as we love him with all of our hearts, we can rest assured that he's not going to leave us hanging. He's not going to leave us as orphans. He's not going to leave us just running around the mountain. He's going to do everything in his power. And that's quite a lot to get us to where he wants us to be. But there has to be a love for him. There has to be an understanding that, hey, this God loved me this much. And out of his loving me this much, it's produced a love in me of him that much. And that's where it all starts. It's not out of duty. It's not out of service. It's not out of, of, of someone uh, telling you to and making you feel obligated. That's the wrong way to view the Christian walk. It's out of love. It's all... It all flows, it all starts and finishes with, with God's love for us, with our love for him. Then he says something that kind of blows me away. I think all of us would know that, right? Sure, we need to love God with all of our heart. But then he says this, he says the second one's just like it. You love your neighbor as yourself. The, the, the whole law and the whole prophet, he says, it hangs on these two commandments. Everything is about loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. I got a new office building at my house, and uh, I really like this thing, man. I kind of custom designed it, and it's got white pine on the walls, and I really like it. And me and my wife have went out and bought some things that we like, things that we like to look at. Some folks have been giving me things, and when we buy these things, you know what we do with them? We put them on the wall. Why? Because we like them. They mean something to us. How do we put them on the wall? Well, it depends on who's putting it on the wall. If I put it on the wall, I get a tape measure, and I measure things out precisely so that I don't hammer any unnecessary nails in that brand new, beautiful white pine. That's the way I do it. That way it's all in the right place. Now, my wife does it a different way. She just stands back and looks at it and says, right there, pop, 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 pop. And if it's not quite right, you just yank that one out and put it over a little bit further. And as long as you leave the sign there, it don't matter because you're not going to see the hole that was created from the... You understand what I'm saying? Amen. That's the way we roll at my house. But the point I'm trying to make is that we hang those things that we love on a nail. And as long as that nail stays there, and as long as it's in the right place, in the place that we want it, then what we hang there is going to be right. And we're going to be able, we're going to, be able to enjoy it. And 
when you hear Jesus say this, upon these two commandments hang everything else, then he's telling us that everything in the spiritual life, in the Christian life, in church life, it's centered around these two principles, around these two things. Your unending, un unquenchable love for God which will produce in you an unfathomable and unconditional love for the other people that are around you. And upon these two things, everything else has to flow. And if it's not coming from this source and from this nail and from this point, then it can get off and it's not going to be right. These two, love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. One of the guys even tried to trick Jesus, said, well, well then, Jesus, who is my neighbor? And y'all know the story. It's the story of the Good Samaritan. And Jesus told a beautiful story about who your neighbor is. And it was the one that you come in contact with that's in need. And so we know that. We need to always put an emphasis on what God does. And we need to always value what he values. And it all comes back every time, according to Jesus, that it all comes back to love. Every bit of it, it all comes back to love. So if he values love, then we need to value love. Listen to me, we're ambassadors of his kingdom. We're children of his. He has set the standard. He set the tone of it all. It's not up, it's not up to us to do that. He's already done that. And so it's up to you and I to just see and hear what he has done and then enter into what he has revealed to us. And it's clearly, uh, according to Jesus, um, a relationship of love. Uh, I think it's kind of interesting that the first fruit of the Spirit, we all know what they are. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness. And I might have added one in there. I'm sorry if I did. Self-control. I didn't mean to. I think, th how many other is there? Nine or seven? Amen. All right. But the first one, the first fruit of the Spirit is love. So here's what you can rest assured of this morning. If God has moved in your heart in a spiritual way and quickened you, then one of the evidences that you can look for of that quickening life of God is love. That's a fruit of the Spirit. Now, there's a lot of other things that we desire to see in each other. Man, we desire holiness. We desire truth. We desire righteousness. Man, we desire so many different things, things that we think should be in the church, things that we think should be in God's people. And the, and the Bible reveals all of those things to be true. But the first and primary fruit of the Spirit, evidence, fruit of the Spirit in a person's life, you know when someone's had that contact with God. You know when they've been to the cross and they've really received the fullness of the Spirit and the presence of God. You'll always know that because it produces in them a, a transparency, in a heart that's able, convicted, uh, compelled to love the other folks that are in their life. That's one of the things that blows me right away about the Apostle Paul. He's one of my heroes. He's one of my favorites. I, I, want, you, I want you to hear what he says. I wrote this down. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, oh man, I knew I would get this. Uh, Paul said this in writing in the letter to the, to the Roman folk, Romans chapter 9, verse 2, in the New Living Translations, listen to what Paul says. Paul says this, he says, my heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people. He's talking about his fellow Jewish folk. He says, my heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my brothers. He says this, I would be willing to be forever cursed. That's what Paul said. Paul said, I'd be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ. If that would mean my brother could be saved. In other words, what Paul was saying is, I love my neighbor and my brother so much that I would be willing to die cut off from God if it meant my neighbor and my brother could be saved. I love them that much. That blows me away that a man could love that much. I mean, he basically was saying, I'd be willing to go to hell if, my, if it would make my neighbor go to heaven. That's love, man. 
And you see that heart in Paul. You see as he ministers to folks, that's where he comes from. It's always out of love. Yeah, he tells folks the truth, but he tells it in love. Yeah, he ministers to people, but he ministers in love. He loves them that much. And somebody said something one day, you. She stood up here, Miss McKenzie, the other day, and she said this. She said, people don't care how much you know until, you know how much you, until they know how much you care. Amen. Did you hear that? People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. No, the truth to that. Love. The Bible says so much about love and loving the brethren and loving, loving those that are around you. You know what? I, I was, we've been married, what, since 2009, so many years ago. I can't remember, what is it, six, seven, <laughs> 10, 11. I got to get correct, huh? 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 60, seven years. Amen. We've been married seven years. I didn't want kids. I'll be honest with you, I didn't want kids. I didn't want them. I was 40 years old when we got married. She had Boo and DJ and listen to me, I was satisfied living for myself. I was satisfied being a selfish man, doing what I wanted to do, when I wanted to do it, and how I wanted to do it. And I didn't really want to share my life with anybody else. I really liked it that way. But God knew he wanted to show me a lesson in love that I could never learn any other way. So he changed my heart, and I fell in love with my wife, really fell in love with her. We dated for three years, then I fell in love with her, and we got married, and I became a dad to, to Boo and the DJ. And then all of a sudden, we wanted to have some more babies. Not some more, we wanted to have one more. And <laughs> God, you know, had another ideal. So we did all that we could do to have that baby. And, and then one day she got pregnant and little Emma come. And then I began to see what love's really all about. Because I love my kids unconditionally. And my life is no longer about me. My life is about them. And I sacrifice to make them happy. I sacrifice to make sure their life is fulfilled. And you know what? I do it with joy. for the joy that set before him. He endured the cross. It wasn't Jesus had to do it. He wanted to do it. And that's the way I am with my kids. And I would have never known that's what love is until I had these kids. And you know what? That's what love is for us too. We learn to sacrifice for one another. We learn, you know what? I thought about this yesterday. I thought, well, how is this a message that all of us can relate to? And then God just quickened my spirit and said, listen, that's a lesson we all need to learn is it's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about what I want, what I desire, what I need. It's about the body. It's about love. It's about one another. Tony Evans preached a message. We went through it in, in, in the Bible study, the men's Bible study. One another is one of the most awesome messages, uh, series of messages I'd ever heard about community living, about valuing one another, about preferring one another. Over and over and over, the scripture talks about you make sure you love your neighbor like you love yourself. So many other scriptures that we can look to. So many different ones. I want to look at a few of them. I can't read when I start crying, man. It just gets kind of... Galatians 5, if you would turn with me there. We'll just roll through it, and when we're out of time, we'll be out of time. Lunch is not going to be ready till 1 o'clock anyway. Amen. They just sent me word over. Galatians chapter 5. Love this. Brother Larry preached about it the other day. He said this, I, For you, brethren, you have been called to liberty. Only do not use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, there it is, through love, serve one another. That's how I do my children, through love. Listen, we went, listen, to, you know what we did yesterday? We, we went to Chuck E. Cheese yesterday. <laughs> on a Saturday. Now, we've been to Chuck E. Cheese before, but we ain't never been on Saturday. It was wild in there, man. I mean wild. And you know what? You want to know where I wanted to be yesterday? Listen, I don't even know where I wanted to be yesterday, but I know where I did not want to be yesterday. 
And the place I didn't want to be was Chuck E. Cheese. But I went to Chuck E. Cheese because I love my family, I love my wife, I love my kids, and I knew it would mean something to them if I got out of myself and got into them. And if I put them ahead of myself, if I considered them before I considered my own wants and needs and desires. And so therefore, I sacrificed myself and my flesh and gave to my family. Now, it turns out that I probably had a better time with them than I had anywhere else. It turns out that my day ended up being more fulfilling than probably anything else I could have done that day because truth of the matter is, if I hadn't went to them, I'd have probably been laying up somewhere laid out doing nothing. And this way, I got to be with my kids. But it all is motivated by love. It seriously is. It's love. And not just love, but sacrificial love. You know what Jesus told the disciples in John chapter 13? He said, a new commandment I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you a new commandment. And he said, the new commandment I'm giving you is that you love your brother like I loved you. That's what he said. You love your brother like I loved you. That's what Jesus told the disciples. Here's a new commandment I'm giving you. You love your brother like I loved you. And then he goes on to say this. He says, by this by this, by the love that you have for one another, that's what he says, by the love that you have for one another, all men will know that you are my disciples. That's how the world's going to know. By the love that we have for one another, the love that we have for the brethren. You know what? We can be holy, and if we don't have love, it, it's nothing. We could, we, could, we could be righteous and pure, and if we don't have love, that's what the book of Corinthians says. Uh, the love chapter. It's nothing. You could do all of these things and if there is no love, the Bible says you're like a sounding gong or a banging cymbal. Listen to me. Without love, it's a false, it's a phony. It's counterfeit. Because anything with, listen, what does the Bible say that God is? God is love. Now, there's not many times the Bible just flat out says God is this. It says God is holy. It says you be holy because he's holy. So we know the Bible says God is love, but one of the things that it just emphasizes is that God is love. He says there in Galatians, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Listen to this, verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Everything is fulfilled in that. The same thing uh, is said in the book of Romans. I'm going to read it to you real quick as well. Romans chapter 13, verse 7. It says this. It says, render therefore to, to their, everyone to their due. Taxes to whom taxes is due. If y'all could put that on the screen, man, I would appreciate it. Romans chapter 13, verse 7. Render therefore to all their due. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Customs to whom customs. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. Verse 8, it says this. It says, owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Well, that's pretty simple, isn't it? I mean, it really is. It just gets it down to the bare naked truth. Here's what it is. It's all about love. Now, Sometimes love is hard. Sometimes love hurts. Sometimes if I love my brother, I'm going to go to my brother and I'm going to tell him the truth even if it hurts him. Now, I'm not saying love's always easy. And I'm not saying love never offends or love never jabs or love never hurts because it does. If you've ever been in love, you know that. But it still always comes back to our love that we have for God and we love that we have for one another. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this knowing that the time is, is now high, it's now time to awake out of your sleep. For now is the day of our salvation. It's nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the evil works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. 
He's talking about this in the context of love. Listen to this. He says, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry, not in drunkenness, not in lewdness, not in lust, not in strife, and not in envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust thereof. Love. When I got saved, I know I talk about me a lot, but I'm sorry, okay? I can't help it. I don't have anybody else to talk to. When I talk about my wife, I get in trouble. And so I'm, I'm going to quit doing it. I'm a dummy, but I'm not that dumb. I can look over there and tell. They were wanting to give me these new glasses that they said you lose your peripheral vision. It's these progressive bifocals. I've never even wore bifocals, but they're wanting to make me. And they said this. They said, when you get it, when you get these, you're going to lose your peripheral vision. And I said, no, I can't lose my peripheral vision in the home I live in. I've got to be able to see out the corner of my eye because my wife doesn't sit in the center of the church. She sits over on the edge, and I've got to be able to see her and see how she's looking at me. Because when she starts looking like that, you know it's time to cut it off. <laughs> Quit talking about her, right? When I got saved in 1998, I, I, I wasn't a mean dude, but I was messed up. I was an addict, I drank, I smoked, I chewed tobacco, and God set me free one Tuesday night, and the next night I walked into a little church on a Wednesday night, and I went to that church for probably six months, and I had no intention of cleaning my life up that much, seriously. I never, I never planned on quitting, stopping drinking, and doing all those other things. I had a bad addiction to a real hard drug, and that's what I wanted to quit. That's what was driving me. That's what was destroying my life. I never intended to quit all the other stuff. <laughs> so I started going to this church, and by the way, I was living in an adulterous relationship at the time. And I went into that church, and as far as I can remember, not one person ever told me what I was doing wrong. Not one person. Not one person ever judged me or condemned me. They just loved me. And as they loved me, and, I was, and as I was able to sit under the preaching of the word, and as I was able to see the Holy Spirit move in amongst God's people, he began to move in my heart. And he began to show me the things in my life that were ungodly, that were unholy, that weren't right. And I began to take care of them things and do business with God as God showed me and the Holy Spirit shined that light on my heart. But it didn't come from an outside source. It came from God himself. And it came through a people that were willing to love me and accept me in the condition that I was in. I mean, I was rough, rough. And they said, come on in. You've got a home here. I remember even one guy, one guy, he invited, listen to me, he invited me to his home to share Christmas with his family. And he had all kinds of little kids in that house, in a little house. He had like eight kids in a two-bedroom house. And so I know that I caused problem for them that Christmas, that Christmas. I didn't realize it at the time, but looking back, man, I know I was a third wheel. I know that his wife was probably thinking, what have you brought home? I ate with them. I stayed with them, they ministered to me, they accepted me, and you know why they did it? They did it because they loved God with their whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. And because of their love for God, they loved people. Even an old drug addict that was unworthy to be loved. I didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve one thing, but yet they loved me anyway. And folks, that's what the gospel message is all about. It's about loving folks so deep and so pure that we reveal God to them. Because that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to reveal Jesus. And if you're going to re reveal Jesus, you better get to loving folk because that's what he did. If you want to reveal him accurately, if you want to reveal the kingdom of heaven, then we best start loving one another and loving our neighbor as we love ourselves because that's what he is and that's what he does. That's what he did for us. And we're called to love even as he loved us. And if we're not doing that, then listen to me. 
We may be preaching to folk, but we're preaching a false gospel. We're giving them a false message and a false ideal of God because God's love. Now, like I say, does that mean we just let people go on down a hellish path of destruction? Absolutely not. But it means we seek out the Father and see how that we can intercede on their behalf. And we seek how we can love them in a way that will captivate their heart. One of the, one of the scriptures I love the most, man, is in Jude. Did you write Jude? Yeah, Jude wrote Jude. And Jude was the brother of Jesus, I believe. Is that right, Brother Larry? Well, just, just nod your head. Folk may not know, so it'd be okay. <laughs> but in Jude, he was talking about ministering to people. And here's what he said. He said, on some people, have compassion, making a difference in their life. On others, save with fear. Pulling them, snatching them up out of the fire. Hating even the, the garments that is defiled by the flesh. But we've got to have a relationship with God to know which method God wants to use at that particular time to minister to the folks that are in our midst. Love, it's all about love. Oh, no man, nothing but to love him. There was something else I wanted to share with you this morning, but I'm not going to be able to. Our love for each other is the element of our spiritual existence according to Jesus that's going to let folks know we are his disciples. That's how they're going to know, by the love that we have for one another. There was an old, there was an old dude, man, what was his name? He was, an old, he was two, 225 A.D., and he was a scholar, but he wasn't a religious scholar. He, he wasn't a Christian scholar. He loved all kinds of other teachings. And one day he went to the games, and when he went to the games, in the Colosseum of that day, what he witnessed was a Christian man being martyred for his love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that shook him up when he seen that Christian man martyred, when he seen someone love God enough that they would love him to death. And that shook him. And so he started to look into this Christian faith. He started to, to, to check it out and to see what it was because he had never seen that before. And he wanted to see what it was in the Christian faith faith that would that would produce that kind of faithfulness and so he began to go to the synagogues he began to follow these new testament believers and he said this is what got him he said behold when i held when i when i beheld the love that they had for one another he said i knew there was something different about that group and i started following them when he beheld the love that's how folks going to know. There's other things that we can look at, and there's lots of them. They should be in our midst. But, but without love for each other, everything else is just simply a counterfeit. Ephesians 4. I, I just want to read you one more, and then I'm done, I promise. Because I'm, I'm going to preach on something else. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, and says this. It says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. But let bitterness, wrath, and anger, and clamor, and evil speaking, let that stuff be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another. Listen to this. Be tenderhearted to one another. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? Be tenderhearted to one another. Be forgiving of one another, even as God in Christ Jesus forgave you. Chapter 5. Therefore, be, imitators, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love. That's what we're called to do. We're called to be imitators of God. And as an imitator of God, we're going to walk in love. It's just that simple. So my question to you this morning, are you walking in love? Are you loving your neighbor as you love yourself? Are you loving your kids? Are you loving your family? Are you loving your spouse, your wife, your husband? Are you loving your brother, your fellow church member? You know what I would feel really good about saying anytime to any church, anywhere, any place I'd say this to any church member man if you ever at all got anything at all in your heart for a fellow brother or sister in Christ you are kidding yourself if you don't get it right make it right and keep it right to think that you can have a fulfilling relationship with the God of love it's just not going to happen we're it we're we're commanded man we're told we're shown 
that that's to be the thing that we keep in our midst, that we keep in our lives. It should drive us. It should move us. It should motivate us. It should compel us every moment of every day to live that kind of life. man. You know what? I think folks will start watching and listening when we start loving. Did you hear me? I think folks will start watching and listening when the church starts loving. It amazes me what I see on Facebook. It amazes me, man. You see someone's heart on Facebook and it amazes me how attacking folk can be to one another. Folk that you know go to church and follow the Lord, but still you see it and you're amazed by it. So my question is, are you a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning? Amen. Are you? Does the world know that you're a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? You hope so? Well, I hope so too. Well, the Bible tells us how we know that they know. By the love that we have. For, this is how they'll know. By the love that we have for one another. Love, love, love. You know what? Who wrote that song? What's love got to do with it? <laughs> Tina Turner wrote that. <laughs> Tina Turner wrote a song, and the name of that song was What's Love Got to Do, Got to Do with It? Well, I'm going to tell you something about Tina Turner. <laughs> she was wrong. Because <laughs> love's got everything to do with it. There's so much more that we could look at, but I'm going to close for now. I think this is a word. I think it's a word for every Christian, man, and every church, every mom, dad, every wife, every husband, every child. Listen to me. Y'all, I, I, you guys aren't excluded at all from this. Because when you love God, you follow him. And when you follow him, you obey him. And when you obey him, you hear those little words in there that says, honor thy father and thy mother, honor the father and the father and the mother. See, it's all, it's for everybody. It doesn't single anybody out, it's for all of us. So as the praise team comes and we, we enter into a, another brief time of worship, uh, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ and this morning as your Lord and Savior, listen to me, I, I want to talk to you about it. That's what I want to do, just talk to you. Uh, I, I want to show you some scriptures and share some things with you. Uh, take all the time we need to because that's the most important thing, that you know him. Uh, if you feel like that you've got something against a brother or sister or anybody as far as that goes, I think you need to seriously pray about getting it right because we can't go on like that, man. It's not godly. You've got to get it right. If we can minister to you in any way, just let us know. I'm going to... There's going to be a few elders here at the front of the church that are able to receive you. Could I have Miss, uh, Miss, wait, Jay and Rhonda, Miss Rhonda, amen. I love you, sister. I didn't forget your name on purpose. It was an accident. Would you come up here, and if there's any ladies that need to be ministered to this morning, be ready for them, and my wife will be sitting here at the front. The main thing is if the Lord is speaking to you, just do business with him.
just for a moment. Well, we're going to get to put some of that love in 